you want to become a better speaker? Yeah. Okay. Here, here. The rest of you are still thinking about ten speech. <laughs> yeah, you want to become a better speaker? That's why you're here. It's the whole point of this whole coming together, the whole point of Toastmasters. And the great thing about Toastmasters is it helps you become a better speaker. Because it has all these things that help you really work out a better speaker. But you're going to become a better speaker, but how do you become a good speaker? Because it's pretty easy to become a better speaker, right? When you start here and you go to here, you're a better speaker. But if you start here and you go to here, you're, you're a good speaker. And I wondered how to become a good speaker and whether it was really happening with Toastmasters. I started what the Toastmasters program would certainly make me better. There's no question about it. Help me do things like exactly John said. Okay, planted on the ground, great. It's vocal variety, move around on stage or not, depending on the situation. And that, that was good. That helped me a lot. But as the time went on, and I started looking over my kind of Toastmasters career, I thought, well, I'm getting better, but the years have gone by, and I don't, don't really think I'm that level of a good speaker. I mean, I'm not the level of a Tony Robbins. I don't command the room. I, I don't really get people involved, I don't want to get people leaning forward. How do you do that? What, what's going on? What am I missing? What's what's not happening here? Is I thought more and more about it, I got kind of frustrated, but angry about all this time I'd spent not becoming the good speaker I wanted to be. A better, big deal, I want to become good. That was really my goal. You know, you haven't ever get a goal like that, you, just, you want to do it, good. My question was, okay, well, you want to be good, how do you figure out how to become a good speaker? So I asked a friend of mine, Rocky Romero, who's a tall guy, a medium-sized guy, dark hair, salesman. Ken knows him pretty well. I said, uh, Rocky, how do you become a good speaker? I said, Tim, well, you talk to good speakers. That makes sense, right? That's what you do. You talk to good speakers. I said, well, how do you find good speakers? Well, fortunately, in Toastmasters, there's the World Champion of Public Speaking. It was recently here, the World Championship of Public Speaking. You know about it, Stellani. You heard about it? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So, I thought, okay, well, these people, people who win the contest, they probably know something about being a good speaker. Does it make sense? Yeah? Okay, so great. So I became a virtual student of the world champions of public speaking. I started buying the books and the DVDs and the CDs and going through the different programs they had. And the more I started doing it, I started noticing, you know, Tim, there's kind of the same thing as being repeated over and over again in different ways. And I started to notice that there was a pattern, there was a, a process to become a good speaker. And I kept repeating this thing over and over again, and it came down to what you know here today is the four acts. It's just as a play is four acts, your speech is four acts. A act, C act, T act, and S act. You have to have all four acts if you want to have a good speech. Now the useful thing about that is once you internalize the four acts, is you can create quick, good speeches pretty darn quickly. And you may wonder, Tim, why would everyone want to create a good speech quickly? Well, let's say, just for instance, a funeral's going on, and the cousin of the person in the casket, his name is the guy's in the casket named Joe, the cousin is a big woman, very, very efficient, very efficient. Says, comes up and he says, Tim, you said you do a eulogy, right? Thinking back over some of the conversations I had, etc., I sort of, yeah, that's right, I did mention something about doing a eulogy, do this. Great. Okay, you'll do the eulogy, about an hour we'll start the funeral, and you'll get up there, and then we'll have the, a couple other pre eulogies, and then you'll go on at the end, uh, they'll, they'll cue you. You go up there, okay? Okay, great, no problem. Except I didn't have a eulogy at all. I had nothing, I had absolutely nothing, I'd completely forgotten about it. But I had the four acts. So I thought, okay, I can put something together that will work and please people and maybe entertain because I have the four acts. First act is the A act of attention. First thing you want to do is get your audience's attention, as you may already know. And the most important reason you get your audience's attention is because your whole audience is wondering who is the speech for? Maybe you're thinking, Tim, well, it's a funeral. Of course they know this speech for the guy in the casket. Yeah, but not just the guy in the casket, it's for the audience. So to make sure your speech is for the audience, use the you. So I thought, okay, I've got to create something that has you in it and involves the guy in the casket, Joe. So I said, 
One thing you probably know about Joe is he's a passionate person. I just took something. It's okay. Use the you. Find something people can agree on, something you know generally about the person. That's the A-act of attention. And now I got everybody's attention right there. Easily, simply, and I got my start on my eulogy. I was starting to write all these things down. Then comes the C-act of content. Content. Now the thing about content, because once the audience knows, okay, speech is for me, great. They say, okay, but what's the problem? You see, if you don't have a problem, you really don't have a speech. And in fact, that's a problem with many, many eulogies. Is they don't have a problem. They just say, hey, he's a great guy, and you run into great guy things, right? And he's a nice guy, and he dresses well, and pays his bills on time, and uh, really good teeth. I like his teeth a lot. You know, <laughs> There's no conflict. There's no story. You're not rambling around, hoping. You've heard these eulogies. Have you heard these? You've been, unfortunately, these eulogies. Hey, he's a wonderful guy, and look at that clothes. Oh, great clothes. And you're know, rambling on and on. No conflict, no problem. So what do you do? What's the problem? So you want to grow the conflict. Grow the comic. What are you talking about? Grow the comic. Well, think about a story about the person that involved them being passionate where there was a conflict. Unfortunately, for Joe, it's very easy. So I said, well, one thing you may know about Joe is that Joe had a parking lot that he had paved. And he wanted to make sure nobody parked on it. But he didn't want to actually pay for a towing service to tow cars away. The problem was people would come up and they would park on the lot because it was there and there was no towing. You know what I'm talking about, so there's no towing signs. So people just keep parking on the lot and they're frustrated the heck out of Joe. He just didn't know what to do about it. Day after day, he said, Tim, these people are parking on my lot. I can't stand it. Now, Joe is a tall guy with a very authoritative voice, very kind of Italian guy, very Joe Russo, very, very passionate. Uh, can't stand it. Ah, these people. What am I going to do? See, so grow the conflict. Grow the conflict, make it bigger and bigger. And people, of course, know Joe, so they're always kind of laughing anyway, because they think Joe, that is the way Joe is. Very, very Italian. So, content. Then you come to the T Act. The T Act is about technique. Technique. Because the most important thing out there is that you've got a problem, and the next question is how do I solve the problem? How do I solve the problem? That's the T act, the technique. So your whole audience is wondering. So you grow the conflict up big, 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 and then you say, okay, here's how to solve the problem. And here's how Joe solved the problem. I said, so what Joe would do, don't know, is he'd throw open his back door, which bordered on the, the lot out there, and he'd just start screaming at the people to go away. He said, Get your car off my parking lot, you idiot! You should not do that! Just, just, just raving, absolutely at the back door, echoing all over this humongous, open, large uh, parking lot area in, in the back. Just echoing down the alleys, you know, the alleys down streetways, etc. So the voice just echoing down the alleys, just screaming his head off. So that was Joe's technique. That was how he solved the problem. So once you solve the problem, you know how to solve the problem. Then the next part is the S Act. S Act of selling. Selling. Because once you get to the final part, even if you do it, then you gotta say, why should I do that? Because ever since you're a little kid, you're wondering why, right? You're wondering why. Why should I do that? So in this eulogy, I thought, okay. Why should you do that? And I thought, well, I don't necessarily want to say that you should do this. You know, the idea about it is that it's bad if you don't, good if you do. Bad if you don't, good if you do. So if you don't do it, it's bad. But if you do it, it's good. However, yelling is not the best technique. So I thought, well, best uh, technique to use. So how do I, how do I sell this thing? I thought, well, so I can use kind of a soft sell. So I don't recommend this technique to get people to stop parking in your parking lot. But all I can say is, it's your work for Joe. So it's a bit of a soft sit. It's a lot of guy. The rest of you will get it later. It's a crack in up like crazy. So anyway, there was more to it. But the most important thing was, 
I finished the eulogy. I'm never going to finish. Just using vocal variety and moving around on stage and all those sort of things Toastmasters said. If I had done the Toastmasters thing of just going through and going through pauses and all sorts of things, I never could have gotten something like that. It was well received. It was great. Because I'm like, you don't know Joe. They did. They got it. They understood. And it perfectly fit into who he was and what it was about. So I was using things like the four acts. Started getting more confident, more certain of my speaking, more certain of my ability to be on stage. So I could give the same speech over and over again to enthusiastic audiences and not so enthusiastic audiences who have heard the same speech over and over again. But I could still do it with confidence and certainty because it had structure, because it had form, because it had pace, because it had flow. And you can do the same thing. Not to say you're always going to be a situation where you have a eulogy to do, a funeral, and you have the eulogy to do, and a plan it. But any speech you ever want to do. So if you aren't quite certain what to do or how to prepare it, or you're trying to like talk to your boss and explain why they should give you a raise, 4X is going to help you do that. If you're in a situation where you've got a really boring business presentation to do, but you still got to sell it to the client somehow, the 4X will get you through that. If you've got a situation where, oh, well, you're an insurance person, growing, thriving, thriving insurance person, building their business, you can use the four acts to engage people to say, geez, see that? Every insurance was so interesting. You've got a few comments like that, haven't you? Ever done? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So once you do that, you develop your own confidence, your own certainty, your own strength, your own ability. Any speaking situation in, use the four acts to help you get better. So, if you're ever in a speaking situation, such as, for instance, eh, you forgot a eulogy, just remember, don't panic. Use the four acts.